Our hearts are glad as we rejoice in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord whose steadfast love endures forever. For the last five weeks, we've heard stories of the many varied ways our one great hour of sharing offerings are making a difference in the United States and in developing countries around the world. As we entered the season of Lent, we were reminded that as the church, we are called and equipped by Christ to share the good news of the gospel. Matthew 25 invites us to engage in the world around us, to serve the poor, to work for justice for the oppressed, and to build up the church. The stories evidence that our gifts work to accomplish that. Recently in the USA, aid with food, shelter, personal protective equipment, and much more has been dispersed during the 2020 and during the pandemic. And if you would like to see all the places in the United States, it shows all over the world, but in the United States, the, the one great hour of sharing offerings are used, you can go to the uh, Presbyterian website, pcusa.org, and then slash OGHS, to view the hundreds of places in our own country where these funds are used. We can ask, when did we see you, Lord, in a time of need, in a time of weakness, in a time of hunger, in a time of thirst? Even without a pandemic, it is a truth, a reminder, that in every time and every season, the church finds itself and its Savior through relationships with those in need. We belong in this place, not just to help to address those needs, though that is surely part of it. We belong there also because it is through relationships with those whom we see experiencing hunger, oppression, thirst, imprisonment, or illness, we might be transformed too as we become, experience, create, and live the church together. If we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. As our one great hour sharing gifts are gathered together next Sunday and added up, to equal a lot. We are the church together. Could we pray together? Meet all the needs for which the world thirsts, O oh God. May your justice, compassion, and peace spring up quickly. And may it spring up quickly in us. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, everybody over here on my side, turn to your right and wave to the people on your left and say, The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And everybody on the left, say, And also with you. And everybody now over here on the left, say, The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Eternal God, whose word silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice but your own. Speak to us through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Amen. The scriptures this morning are from the New Revised Standard Version. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. Psalm 118 is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament. It starts and ends with a celebration of deliverance. 
that this gospel story is a rather, rather puzzling event in Jesus' life. You know, you wonder why is it, why is it there? Uh, it's, a, it's a story that's found in all four of the gospels. And that doesn't happen very often, you know, other than the crucifixion and, and the, uh, the, this story and one or two of the stories that Jesus tells. Sometimes they're in two Gospels, maybe even three Gospels, but very few of things in Jesus' life in this are found in all four of the Gospels. And this is one of them. So in some sense, this was considered an important event, something that we wanted to, that they wanted us to pay attention to. So, but, but it seems strange that he would do this. This is the third or fourth time, depending on which gospel you're reading, Jesus has been in Jerusalem. He usually slips in and out. People don't know, you know, the, at least the religious authorities do not know he's there. So why did Jesus do this? We have named this event the triumphal entry. And you, you wonder to yourselves, why, was, why would Jesus draw attention to himself in this particular way? Especially in the, in the Gospel according to St. Mark, uh, the fact that he would bring attention to himself is very rare. Uh, Mark usually, in Mark's Gospel, whenever Jesus does something, whenever he heals someone, wherever, so, wherever some miracle takes place, he tells people, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody who, who did this. It's what, what, what uh, scholars call the messianic secret in Mark. Jesus is keeping a low profile in the Gospel according to Mark until this moment. Where he comes in and basically announces his presence not just to the people that are with him and the people gathered on the streets cheering for him, but for the religious authorities. You ever see that scene in Jesus Christ Superstar when they're all up, so the religious authorities are sort of up on the, at, in the higher windows or up on the top, the roof of buildings, staring down at all this that's going on and deciding that something has to be done. that Jesus has to die. There's an irony in the, in the telling of this story, and that is that Jesus and the readers and hearers of the story that are later told know something that the crowds and the disciples don't know. We know the end. We know that by the end of the week, Jesus is arrested, that he's tried, that he's executed by crucifixion, entombed in a cave that's sealed with a stone, and ultimately the stone is rolled away and Jesus is raised from the dead. No one in the story, even the disciples, know any of this. It makes it a little hard, at least it makes it hard for me to sort of understand uh, what they were going through. Because I already know what the end is. It's like reading a book that you've read before. And I do that a lot, to be honest with you. I read books that I've read before because I know what's going to happen. But I want to read it again. Maybe that's, maybe that's what, what the scriptures are all about. It's something that, that we want to read again because we know we know what the end of the story is. We know what the promises are. They're already there. We've heard the stories. We've read the stories. We've studied the stories. One of the central claims of the Christian tradition is, has been that God is love. But we often talk about love in kind of superficial ways, uh, in a, a, an emotional fashion. You know, one time there was a joke, at least among pastors, that 
uh, the the words of a of a wedding should be uh, at a wedding should be uh, I promise to uh, to be your wife or to be your husband until we don't love each other anymore. <laughs> and that's a pretty sad thing to think about. But we talk about love in ways that don't really talk about what love really is supposed to be. Something that grips us, that holds on to us, and all of us can look at someone in our lives, can look someplace in our lives and see where that love is real and lasting. The kind of love that we're talking about when we say God is love. All those different times, you know, go all those different times through the Old Testament where, where the, uh, where God's people do things that they shouldn't do. They're told not to, and they do it anyway. We've all been there, and God loves us through those things. Palm Sunday and the Holy Week to follow show that Jesus died not to demonstrate a superficial love, but to show what love is in fact, that love is a commitment, something that we make a promise to do. And, and, and I'm going to go back. I've, I've probably told this story before. The very first sermon I preached, I stole the, the main point of the, of the story from, from another preacher because I didn't know anything about preaching back then. It was like my first year after college. In the summer I was home and that, that asked to preach in my home church. And I stole the line, love is something you do. Five or six years ago, however long it's been since the last time I was back in, in Iowa, uh, a woman came up to me, because I preached at that service, it had been however many years in between uh, that first time and the last time I preached there. And she came up to me and she says, I remember something you said the first time you preached. I went, oh my God, I can't believe that. And she said, love is something you do. Palm Sunday shows how, how often we misinterpret God's love as well as our own love for God. We cannot skip from Palm Sunday to Easter Day because true love, true love shows itself in acts of compassion towards the afflicted and the oppressed. I'm not a big fan. I've been, I took a class recently, a uh, four-week class about difficult biblical texts with Zoom. And, and it, 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 at first it was fun. You know, using Zoom was fun. Now it's just kind of tedious for me. You know, I don't, I don't like the lack of contact. But I took this four-week class about difficult texts of the Bible. It had to do with, with uh, money which is always a difficult thing to talk about in the church. Or not so much about money as about the poor. And the way that we often use the Bible against the poor, in spite of the fact that, that God always stands up for the poor in Scripture. Always stands up for the poor in Scripture. God's love is shown in those acts of compassion toward the afflicted and the oppressed. True love shows itself in acts of suffering with those in greatest need, and that's why you can't go from Palm Sunday to Easter Day without all the things that happen in the middle. Because then you don't see the love Jesus displays as he speaks to his disciples that last time, as we're told in the book of in the Gospel according to St. John. Love one another, he says there, as I have loved you.
True love shows itself in acts of suffering with those in greatest need. <coughs> One of the, the, the woman that was leading this Bible study uh, works with the poor in New York City, runs an agency there. Uh, she's got a PhD in New Testament studies, so she knew what she was talking about as we went through the Bible, uh, the New Testament that day, that those four weeks. But she also, and, and many of you may know William Barber. William Barber is the African-American man who leads the Poor People's Campaign. Funny thing though, I never knew it until I went to this Zoom class because she is actually the co-moderator of the Poor People's Campaign. But you never see her. because I think because she's a pretty white, white woman and they want this African-American man to be the face of that campaign because we just write off, we just write off pr pretty white girls, pretty white women. Don't take them as seriously. In Jesus we recognize how different our love is from God and how oftentimes our love is superficial and not really that serious and not really directed in the right ways to the right people. Oh sure, of course, we love our family. We love those people that we're close to, that are special to us, that are important to us. But we have to remember that God's love, God's love was for everyone. Jesus' love was for everyone. The challenge for us on Palm Sunday is to begin to recognize that love that Jesus displayed as he rode in Jerusalem knowing, knowing that he was going to be killed by the end of the week. Years, years and years ago, I read The Last Temptation of Christ, which was made into a terrible movie. Uh, the Last Temptation of Christ begins with Jesus hanging on the cross. If you've ever seen the paperback, it's about yay thick. It's a huge book. It begins with him, hanging, with him on the, hanging on the cross for the first few pages. And then suddenly, Jesus is a young man who made different choices, who, who marries and have, has children. And it goes through this whole, and all these hundreds of pages to describe his life. Until in the last couple of pages, suddenly, Jesus is hanging on the cross again. All of that in between was the last temptation of Christ to make other choices than to love the whole world. Amen. Let us finish this service well by reminding ourselves that it is not we who chose Christ, but Christ who chose us. Let us recall that we were not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace. Let us remember that we were not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us. And keep in mind that we do not go our separate ways alone, but in the company of the Holy Spirit, who has great things in store for us. Go into the world in peace, embraced by the steadfast love of God, blessed by the humility and courage of Jesus Christ, and filled with the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain seated until you're dismissed.